Good morning, Centennial. Today is Friday, April 12th, and you're watching Titan TV. I'm Morgan Yarnick. And I'm Braylon Becton. Thanks for tuning in. We are far into the second semester of school, but that doesn't mean that students should stop working hard. Our reporter breaks down the weighted GPA system. It's a game they play for four years and can determine the rest of their lives. Everyone's a player, and to get to the top of the leaderboards is not only a challenge, but a struggle. This is the GPA game. GPA at Centennial is based on a 5.0 scale. Each grade in each class has a weight and you receive points depending on your grade and the level of class. Levels include, in ascending order, regular, college slash dual credit, and finally pre-AP and AP classes. For example, to get a 5.0 GPA, you have to have 100s in all regular classes, 95 in all college slash dual credit classes, or a 90 in all pre-AP slash AP classes you will receive no credit for getting a grade below a 70. Do the benefits outweigh the costs? We asked Centennial students and staff. I, I really like the GPA system just because it like gives a tangible aspect to like the goals of the academic system. For example, like if I, without the GPA system, there's like no real measurement of whether or not you're doing well because I mean you have numeric grades, but there's no calculation that's cross curricular that decides who's like the best overall. It shows that I'm good here, 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 and here, and so it doesn't let someone who's like just good here to excel above someone who's more well rounded. Our educational system puts a lot of emphasis on external motivation instead of intrinsically motivating us to want to succeed and to want to learn. And until we get rid of the GPA system, well, you're not going to have any kids who want to learn just for the sake of learning. It puts us into competition and it makes us want to motivate ourselves to work harder, but sometimes it gets to us so much and there's no really reason for a kid to be stressing over something so simple as GPA. And so personally, I'm just, I'm just against it. I just think that uh, the GPA, a lot of people hate it, a lot of my kids are obsessed with it, but uh, I don't know what you replace it with, so it's almost like a necessary evil. Something's got to be there to say who is stronger than someone else to someone who cares at college somewhere, but uh, I know that everyone hates it, but I think it's just necessary. Your GPA also determines your class rank. According to the Texas House Bill 588, commonly referred to as the top 10% law, students in the top 10% of their graduating class will have automatic admission to almost any public school in Texas. You can check your GPA and your class rank at Family Connections off of the Centennial website. Here are the averages of each class's GPA in the top 10% at Centennial, as well as the valedictorian's GPA. To be in the top 10%, you will need around an average of 4.9 GPA, and to be number one, you would have to have a GPA of about 5.5. Students have college on the mind. Everything is about admission to the perfect college. Unfortunately, the GPA system is not perfect, but it's the best we have right now. I'm Eric, Titan TV. Thanks, Eric. GPA can play a big role in college admissions. In fact, one centennial student has been accepted to a university that's across the Pacific. Most seniors are making plans to attend college in the fall. Some are staying in here in Texas, but others will be studying in different states. One student will be crossing the globe for the next step in his education. I originally applied to NYU, and I applied for a separate program um, which puts their students in Shanghai, China, and I got accepted. So NYU invited me all expense paid trip to Shanghai for four days. Wes tells us what he will be learning in Shanghai. I'll be studying economics and um, international finance and international business. But because NYU is a liberal arts school, we don't just study stuff that's in our field. I'll also have to take courses on art and history and chemistry. Um, I'm going to be a well-rounded. You, you have to know everything to go to NYU. It's not just your major. It's everything. The lifestyle of China seems to be different than that in the United States. A lot of people don't speak English. Like if you're, if you're at nighttime, you're trying to navigate a taxi, your taxi person, is, he isn't going to know English. So you're forced to speak it. And also when you haggle, because China's a haggling country, you haggle for pretty much everything. Um, it's best to know Chinese. Like you'll say, um, 
after they give you a price, they'll give you this extremely high price. You say, Taiguela, which means too much or that's too expensive. And then they'll, know, they'll lower the price by 25% and you'll end up paying maybe a third of the original price. We wish Mark the best for his college career. I'm Sean McGee, Titan TV. Good luck in China. Don't forget about us in Frisco. Speaking of Frisco, with all the recent growth, it's easy to forget that Frisco was once a small town. Kayla has more. The beautiful and relaxing Central Park features cattle statues symbolizing an area that was once a small rest stop along the Shawnee Trail. This city is now a sprawling suburb of Dallas. Named after the St. Louis San Francisco Railroad, Frisco carries on a rich legacy and history 111 years after its establishment. Right, Frisco was founded in February of 1902. The St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad brought their tracks through this part of North Central Texas in 1902. Uh, and they formed a subsidiary company called the Blackland Townsite Company, which purchased the farm of Mr. Emerson, and then they laid it out in lots and blocks, and they had a public auction. February of 1902 was that first public auction, and so people began to come here uh, and build houses, or they moved their businesses here. There were lots of little communities in this area, but Frisco got the railroad. People who came here mostly were farmers. Cotton was a major crop that was sold here, but they also raised uh, wheat and oats. Uh, the, the city is here because the railroad came, but farming is how it sus sustained itself uh, until just in the last probably 20 years or so. Frisco is a city that is constantly changing. After all, it is progress in motion. This is Kayla Ritchie, Titan TV. Frisco seems to have come a long way. Whether you like the ice, court, or field, sports are a major factor in the economic growth of Frisco. Hey Titans, as you know, the Frisco Rough Riders, Texas Legends, and Tornado all have a major impact on Frisco. I talked to several people about the specifics. Uh, roughly 60-ish uh, uh, percent of, of the folks coming to Dr. Pepper Ballpark are coming from outside of Frisco, uh, from the surrounding communities and all the way from uh, uh, downtown Dallas and, and north is where they come. We get a lot of folks from southern Oklahoma who will come out to our ballpark as well. So our demographics, if you come out here to the ballpark, it's tons of young families, uh, a lot of affluent families, educated families, and kind of a wide spectrum of folks that, who do come in from all over uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. We definitely love having the uh, Rough Riders in the area because it's a positive effect on the economy as well as our location here. Our sales tend to go up anywhere between 4 to 10 percent. That's before and after the event. So we definitely love having the Rough Riders here in the area. Our reputation has really gone far and wide on the sports side. We need to continually bring new people to Frisco to shop in our retail stores, stay overnight in our hotels, and have lunch and dinner in our restaurants. So it's all part of an economic package that we needed to generate a, a healthy tourism industry in our city to help support our local businesses. So we were the first sports team here, uh, and then the Legends came, and then the Rough Riders came, and it really took off as kind of a minor league sports hub. Whenever, you know, when families move, they're always looking for, obviously, you know, family-friendly neighborhoods and, and entertainment and places where there's things to do. And that's what the Tornado, that's what the Legends, that's what the Rough Riders, that's what all, we can, we can all provide that. I, I think this helps out Frisco economically in a lot of ways. First of all, every game we have, we have people coming from outside of Frisco to attend the games. And everyone who comes in here who spends money generates sales tax, which ultimately benefit the city of Frisco. So that's tremendous. I'm Abby, Titan TV. Thanks, Abby. And now for club updates. Nothing But Nets is Centennial's annual faculty versus students basketball game. At 4.30 on April 18th, come out to the main gym to support your favorite athletes and teachers. Last night, new NHS members were inducted for the 2013-2014 school year. Congrats to the new members. Two weeks ago, NHS hosted their annual Easter egg hunt here at Centennial in the courtyard. Over 50 children of teachers and staff came out and had an awesome time hunting for eggs and taking pictures with the Easter Bunny. This was an excellent opportunity for NHS members to get service hours while also showing their appreciation to staff members for all they do here on campus. Hey there Titans, I'm Ashlyn with your sports update. This past Tuesday our Titan softball team fought hard but lost to Wakeland 8-12. They take on Frisco tonight here at 7. 
Also on Tuesday, the varsity baseball team defeated Liberty 3-2, pulling out a final run in the last inning to clinch the win. They are currently first in the district, so make sure to come out and cheer them on tonight as they take on Wakeland. The game will begin at 7.30. The district meet for track began yesterday and will finish tonight. Good luck, boys. Even for the most successful teams, injuries can be unavoidable. Matt takes a look at how head injuries are being prevented. The risk associated with contact sports has become a growing concern across America today. We take a look at the effect these sports can have on the brain and what we can do to help. We interviewed CHS Athletic Director Mark Howard on his thoughts on how head injuries have changed contact sports and what has been done to make sports safer for athletes. I think a lot of sports nowadays, and especially in football since it is a contact sport, have done a lot to try to prevent, um, not just based on what has been found before, but because the head is just, a, the brain is a very delicate thing. A recent study was carried out comparing healthy athletes to those of the same age who suffered from a concussion 30 years ago. The results showed that those who experienced head trauma had symptoms similar to those of early Parkinson's disease, as well as memory and attention deficits. We asked current CHS football player Eric Robeson about his concussion and whether he thinks enough action is being done to prevent head injuries in contact sports. Better, like checking of the um, air pressure in the helmets could help, um, but it's football. You know, there's going to be big hits and concussions are going to happen no matter what. So you really can't fully take them out of out of the game. Honestly, I think contact sports have come a long way in in that particular regard. And I think a prime example is the NFL and what they're doing right now with their concussion studies. And going back and they're finding because of research done on former NFL players who are now deceased, they're doing research on their brains and finding out that in fact a lot of these guys did have, um, especially when they passed away early, they've, they've had concussions and they happened earlier in their career. Technology in diagnosing and treating concussions has come a long way, but there is always room for improvement. It is imperative that athletes are properly diagnosed because if an athlete who is recovering from an initial concussion sustains another concussion, permanent neurological dysfunction or death could occur. I think probably education is the biggest thing that we can do. If we can educate our coaches and just the public in general, moms and dads, about um, the potential of, of concussions and us doing everything that we can, whatever that means, whether it's buying our kids helmets to wear, I'm talking about at home, uh, anything we can to protect their helmet in, in the form of some kind of helmet device, I think we need to do that. Remember Titans, rules are only there to protect you. This is Matt, Titan TV. That's it for this week's edition of Titan TV. Thanks for watching.